So just before I uh, introduce our uh, speakers for this keynote session, I just wanted to make, uh, say one thing you know from previous versions of the program that in a later session uh, we were due to, we were hoping to have Larry Summers with us. Larry Summers sadly was not able to join us today because of a serious health, you, health issue in his family. But I just wanted to assure you that uh, he and the fellow panelists, uh, Angeliki Frangiu and Evangelos Marinakis, uh, will be coming back uh, for that session uh, for a, a dialogue that we are rescheduling uh, for later in this year or early next year. So that will happen, just not today. But now for this session, I'm delighted to uh, welcome as our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, needs very little introduction. Professor Stiglitz from Columbia University, a Nobel Prize winner, and also a um, person who's been at the highest levels of policy making in America as well. So combining the world of academe and also real world policy making. And Evangelos Mitilineos, chairman and CEO of Mitilineos Energy and Metals, who will give us a business perspective on the momentous events that are happening in the world. But first, Joe and both of you, very welcome. And Joe, please do go ahead and give us your thoughts on the situation we're faced with. Okay, well, thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very uh, difficult time to give uh, predictions, forecasts, uh, or even interpretations. Uh, if I had uh, given a forecast before October 7th, it, it's going to be very different from after October 7th, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So later on, as I go through the talk, I'll, I'll try to um, uh, clarify how uh, the events of the Hamas-Israeli uh, um, situation uh, may uh, affect uh, where we're going. So there are three topics I'm, I'm going to cover. Um, the first thing I, that I was asked is, you know, have we learned the lessons of uh, the great financial crisis? Uh, 14 years ago, uh, where are we 14 years uh, afterwards? Uh, um, I'm going to look at it from a very uh, international perspective, particularly an American perspective. And then uh, the second topic, I'm going to look uh, more narrowly uh, on Greece. And then finally, I'm going to give a, a, a very uh, global picture of where uh, the world is going. Uh, both from the perspective of before October 7th and after October 7th. So uh, first, uh, on um, have we uh, absorbed uh, the lessons of 2008, the Euro crisis, um, which was the most traumatic economic crisis in 75 years? And I guess I'd say uh, a little bit. Uh, we. There have been changes, uh, but not enough. And some of the things that, that have happened uh, in the last year or two uh, uh, bolster my, my perspective that we haven't uh, done enough. Um, the um, one way of looking, you know, every moment in history is related to previous moments, and so uh, there is a sort of a, a web that goes throughout, so you can't divide what happened. But it's hard to remember that in the years before the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there was discussion of what was called the Great Moderation. The Great Moderation was the claim under Greenspan, uh, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, that we had solved the problem of the business cycle. It was over. And there were economists like Bob Lucas at the University of Chicago who famously said uh, in a speech <laughs> four years before the financial crisis, we have, as an economics profession, solved the problem of uh, crises. 
and that we know how to avoid them. That's history. Well, it wasn't history. And uh, the, from my perspective, the interesting thing was that we were at that very moment sowing the seeds of what came to be the 2008 financial crisis through financial sector deregulation and liberalization. And uh, we allowed uh, the banks basically to take uh, enormous risks. The background for that goes back further in history because we had the Great Depression. And after the Great Depression, we imposed very strong financial regulations. And we had more than 50 years of almost no crises anywhere in the world. But then we thought because uh, we hadn't had any crises, we didn't need financial regulations. And so they took them away and lo and behold, uh, you started having uh, crisis after crisis, more than uh, 100 around the world. Well, uh, afterwards we passed in the United States the Dodd-Frank bill uh, and then began a process of undoing this I remember being at a dinner uh, right before uh, Trump came in, off came in office and one of his chief advisors was saying uh, they were going to uh, strip away the regulations. And I said, you know, don't you remember that we had a financial crisis uh, just a few years earlier? And that was already ancient history. So under the current chairman, Jerome Powell, they took away the re oh, many of the regulations. And um, what we saw once again is the problem that we had before, short-termism and bad risk management led us to some more financial crises. Uh, not financial crises, but uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank went bankrupt. These were big bankruptcies, costing American taxpayers in tens of billions of dollars. So it's not a small, these weren't small events. They didn't, uh, because we had, had imposed stronger capital requirements, they didn't lead to a systemic crisis. So that's the glass half full. We had done something, but we clearly hadn't, uh, uh, address the fundamental problem. And uh, Silicon Valley Bank is not a minor bank for the US and global economy. Half of all the startups, all those tech companies that have made been so important for the US economy and the global economy had uh, banked at Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, so it was a big thing. Um, let me go on fairly uh, quickly uh, to the other topics because I see my time is running out. Uh, um, let me come down to Greece. Um, before I came here, I, I spent uh, a couple of days in, in Athens, and you could feel the the energy. The 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 you know the uh, it 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 uh, it was a great recovery from uh, those of us went here in the days of the Euro crisis. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the statistics, uh, they're not great. Uh, Greece is still below the level that it was before the, Euro, uh, before the Greek crisis, the Euro crisis. Uh, you know, in Latin America, we talked about the last decade. You're talking about the decade and a half. Now, to be fair, you have the uh, COVID-19 uh, in, in between, but still a decade and a half of no growth is something that, to be worried about. Um, looking at it as an outsider, uh, you know, the natural question is, uh, how well is Greece poised going forward? It's had strong growth this year, among the strongest in Europe. But what about the longer run? And uh, let, me, let me just mention uh, five concerns I have. May, uh, hopefully you, you'll discuss these 
not only in this session, but later. Um, one of them is um, the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit uh, does a review every year of democracy. And while overall uh, things aren't so bad, there's one area that is a particular concern to me, which is free press. And uh, uh, you can't have a vibrant democracy without a vibrant media. And uh, your score in that is, is, is uh, of worry. The second thing is that um, you have a, Greece hasn't had the structural transformation that is needed. Uh, your growth is disproportionately in tourism. Tourism is a vulnerable industry. Uh, it's vulnerable uh, for a whole variety of reasons. One of them is you live in a very dangerous part of the world. Uh, there, and, and tourists are sensitive. A second reason is that um, uh, uh, climate change. Uh, getting warmer in the summer, fire, wildfires, uh, those are things that affect tourism. So economists, I mean, we go around telling every country they need to diversify, uh, but uh, I think the, the argument for uh, Greece is particularly uh, strong. And uh, two aspects of that diversification, one is uh, climate, energy, uh, you have a strong endowment of sunlight and wind, and the question is, have you fully utilized that? Um, and uh, the weather is variable, but I think dictators like Putin and MBS in Saudi Arabia are more uncertain. And so I would be, I'd rather be reliant on, on nature than I would on Putin and MBS. Um, fourthly, uh, mentioned in the first session today was uh, technology. Um, we live in a technological world and uh, keeping up in technology is a race for everybody. And I think, uh, you know, we're worrying about what it will do to our society. I think it's something that every country needs to uh, 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 think about. And finally, let me mention uh, a macro problem that is going to be facing uh, Greece for a long time is the repayment of the debt is going to require primary surpluses and maintaining a strong macro economy in the face of those primary surpluses is, is not going to be easy. Let me in the remaining couple of minutes um, talk about um, global issues. Um, I'll begin with the United States. Uh, the big problem as we emerged from uh, the pandemic was inflation, uh, the highest inflation we'd had for a long time. And there was a big debate in the United States of what was the cause. And there were two schools of thought. Uh, was it excess demand caused by overzealous spending by the Biden administration particularly in trying to protect us from the COVID-19? Or was it supply side interruptions and demand shifts associated with the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine? I thought the evidence was unambiguous. It was mostly supply side problems and aggregate demand was actually lower than uh, projected before the, the uh, 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 COVID came out, pandemic. Um, the Federal Reserve misdiagnosed the problem. It thought it was an aggregate demand, raised interest rates. You don't get more oil, you don't get more chips for cars. That was one of the main sources of inflation in the beginning. Uh, you don't get more housing by raising interest rates. You actually get less housing, and therefore uh, housing costs go up. So I thought they had the wrong recipe, and uh, there, 
The good news is that the supply side uh, things got reversed, are disinflationary. Inflation has come way down below 3% and is clearly stable. Um, what is, I, I'm, I, I'm hopeful and was hopeful before at least uh, October 7th that uh, we would have a soft landing. That, but their soft landing was a combination of two big mistakes. One, the Fed raised interest rates too much, but at the same time, we had a very strong fiscal policy, stronger than anybody intended. And this is uh, really uh, important in the global perspective. U.S. finally adopted uh, industrial policy for climate change. We thought it was uh, a bill of around 300 and some billion dollars, but it was an open-ended tax credit that looks like now well over $1 trillion. Some people estimate $1.5 trillion. So that is going to counter the contractionary. One, so there are two, two uh, risks here. One is the Republican Party is in disarray and we don't have a functioning government and we'll probably have a, a, a government shutdown. And the second one is what happens uh, in uh, Israel. And um, I'll, let me come to that in just a minute. Uh, first, uh, talk just a minute about where Europe is. Uh, Europe is obviously in a slowdown. It doesn't have a number of the advantages that the U.S. has. It doesn't have the advantage of cheap energy. It doesn't have the advantage of a very expansive fiscal policy. But the ECB, to keep up with the U.S., and worried about inflation and with the same mis misdiagnosis has raised interest rates. And that's going to dampen uh, the European uh, economy. Uh, the final thing about the European economy is it's very dependent on China. China, remember, was what got us out of the 2008 crisis. It, it, it accounted for a very large part of the global growth after 2008 after the euro crisis. It's not there now. Growth is down 4 or 5%. Some people think it's even lower than that. Uh, China has a whole set of economic problems I can't go into right now, but the European dependence on China, particularly Germany, is a problem. Um, now, uh, I don't have time to talk about the tension between the US and China, and the, and the where you uh, fix into that. Let me just uh, final, uh, conclude in what my view of the, the worry is. The worry is that the conflagration in the Middle East will, because of, partly because of the Arab street, force Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, all to do what happened in the 1970s, which is reduce the supply of oil. It's the one weapon they have, the economic weapon. And it's an interesting economic weapon because as they reduce their supply of oil, the price of oil goes up and they're actually better off because the, the demand elasticity is very low. So the, it, it's a way that, that they collude together in effect raising the price, but that spike in price is going to reignite inflation, and that reigniting inflation may have very big implications for politics in both Europe and in the United States. The election in the United States, the polls show, is going to be close. This could be something that could tip the balance, and uh, it's very likely that Trump will win the primaries. If it tips the balance and he wins in the final election, it will have very big repercussions for the world uh, uh, with weakening of support in the war against Ukraine, 
uh, weakening of the rule of international rule of law, a uh, whole set of consequences that are almost unfathomable. So, thank you. Well, lots to think about there, and we'll certainly pick up the question of the U.S. politics in a minute. Can I just come back to your fundamental analysis on, on that the Fed, has in essence, got it wrong, which is a, which is a sort of accusation number one. <laughs> you, Jerome Powell, got this wrong. If you were chairman of the Fed, you would not have, or at least not raised rates to anything like the extent that, 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 that he did. So the question is on the other side. Okay, if that's not the policy response and the problem is supply side, what should the government have done and perhaps what should still be done to ease the supply side? Because certain other elements of American policy, in particular, you know, fighting with China over trade and that sort of thing, aggravates the supply side effect. So how would you have addressed that had you been in charge? Yeah, uh, but I wasn't. Um. Yeah, yeah, but you don't get off the hook. I'm sorry, you, you have to, you know, you can, there's no free criticism here. You have no, to no, say no, what no, you no, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the first thing I would have done is think about what we could do to address some of the supply side problems. So in the beginning, remember, there was a lot of debate about whether we uh, had a shortage of labor. And there are two or three things that we could have done. Uh, the United States provides less support for women in the labor force than most of the European countries do. Uh, we could have provided more child support. We do not have any requirement for family leave policy. And we have no requirement for sick leave policy. And we could have changed those policies and that would have gotten a lot of people back to work earlier. Um, in terms of um, energy, uh, we could have provided a guarantee for the next five years in energy prices, and that would have elicited a large supply response. And one of the remarkable things is the price was so high, there was very little supply response. And that was because a lot of people say, we don't know how long the war is going to last, and the prices will come down, and why should we make those investments for a short period of time? If they had said, we'll give you a five-year guarantee, you would have had a, I think, most estimates, a very strong energy supply. Talk about housing, uh, we could have uh, elicited a lot more investment in housing. Raising the interest rates discourages the investment in, in housing. So uh, those are the supply side things that, uh, that I would have done. We also continue to talk about, in, in terms of our tensions with, with China, we continue to have a, a WTO illegal um, tariff of about 25% on a whole range of goods from China. And that would have brought down uh, the price of those goods. So uh, there actually were a, a lot of policies. And then finally, let me mention uh, one of the things that was um, uh, very big was market power. Mm -hmm. uh, prices relative to cost went up in many industries, uh, in including in energy. Um, we, uh, some of this was because of monopoly. Uh, we had, uh, just a, as one example, very dramatic, we had a shortage of uh, baby formula. Uh, and this was, you know, sort of amazing in a country, a rich country, you couldn't get baby formula. And the reason was that one company accounted for 50% of the baby formula. It's not a complex product, but one company had 50% of market share. And then they discovered that, that one company forgot about the importance of uh, keeping things clean for babies. And so it was shut down. And of course that led to uh, a massive shortage. It eventually worked out, but it was terrible. But the other thing we didn't do, and a few countries have done well, is we didn't have a windfall profits tax on the excess profits, and we could have used that, that revenues from that to dampen the effects on prices, 
And that would have uh, helped absorb the inflationary shock. Okay, well, just one more question to you, and then I want to come on to, to the commentary. Uh, the the, the, the uh, um, power of the strength of the U US economy, thank goodness, has been awesome and has kept... Um, you said it was China that took us out of the crisis 14 years ago, but it's been the US economy that's been powering the world substantially in, in, in recent times. Despite predictions that there would be a recession when interest went, rates went so high, it hasn't happened yet. Do you think there'll be a US recession now? Could the crisis in the Middle East throw it over the edge? Um, no, I'm, I'm still optimistic. I mean, going back to this massive fiscal policy for a good purpose, Poorly designed, I, I, let me, but it is having a uh, big effect uh, uh, from what everybody so that, says. That stimulus and, will carry the U.S. through. And the stimulus think? will carry us through, even though the higher interest rates is, is dampening us down. Obviously, the big uncertainty is how high will energy prices go if things blow up in the Middle East? And um, if, if they do blow up and, and oil and gas prices spike, uh, then it becomes much more, it's much harder to predict because it depends on how high they go and what policy responses uh, we have. For the U.S., the U.S. now is very largely energy dependent, mm -hmm. independent. And that means when the price of oil goes up, it's mainly a redistribution from users, whether they're firms or consumers, to the oil companies. So if you manage it right and you take that extra profit that the oil companies get and you redistribute it to the consumers and the users who do it, then we'll, we'll be able to manage our way through whatever the, the price hike is. Europe is in a different position on that. Um, I tried to get the Biden administration to have that kind of windfall profits tax, and there were many other people who were trying. Uh, we didn't succeed. Whether if It's that a big debate in my country as well, of course, in the UK. Yeah. Uh, you did more than we did on that windfall profits tax. Yeah, not as, not as much as the opposition, for example, was asking for. But, yeah. yeah. But if we do that, then we can protect ourselves. Europe can't. But for us, that will enable us to maintain our growth. If we don't, uh, it, it'll, it'll be a big negative. Yeah. So, Mr. Mitterlinos, li listening to all of this, I can imagine you agree with quite a lot of it, but perhaps not a windfall tax on energy. Was that... Um, it is uh, difficult to argue with uh, Professor Stiglitz. My, my problem with, with this conversation is that I, I agree in most things with the Professor. So, even, not, not even, much to even, argue even, about. Even, even on a, with a, a windfall tax on, on uh, energy companies? Well, as a matter of fact, last year, uh, in a small economy like Greece, the, the windfall tax uh, we energy companies had to pay uh, what was north of the 1 billion euros. Uh, so that, that's a lot of money for Greece. Where did this money go? This money go to subsidize the low income consumers. And uh, therefore, in a, in, a, in a social sense of the meaning, it worked. Uh, how, long, how long can that last and how things are going to play out going forward, it remains to be seen. I heard the professor very carefully. Uh, I want to say a couple of things about Greece. I will not spend uh, as much time. He, professor deserves much more time in the conversation with all respect. So, so Greece has, uh, since uh, 2008 has faced a multiple crisis. However, to have to say, it has managed to respond effectively, become resilient and successfully overcome challenges 
and serve the international as an international example. There's no doubt about it. Today, Greece is experiencing growth, earning investment grade, grade ratings. Last week, as you know, that told us, made us very happy and become an attractive investment destination. Uh, yesterday evening, we, uh, I was present at the initiation of the new investment of Fairfax uh, of Canada in, in uh, south of, uh, of Athens in the 300 uh, million tourist project, which is an example of what can happen in Greece going forward. But if I were to identify pillars for the country's further development, apart from the shipping, which is always thriving in the global marketplace, is probably number one. Uh, and apart from tourism that the professor mentioned, I would certainly add industrial production and processing as well as the digital transformation. So Greece, I think, is a good example for the European Union at the moment. My perspective of the world uh, is the European perspective. Uh, I happen to be president of the European Metals Association and I get in touch with a lot of big companies in uh, in the marketplace and uh, we did not have the chance to talk uh, what's happening in Europe. We talked about the US and China. I have a view on, on the US. Um, we have to admit that the world is uh, in a turbulent situation that we have not witnessed for years. Uh, 2008 uh, I think we never really recovered. It was a, surface, a recovery on the surface. Deep, the recovery never came. And then we had the pandemic. And uh, right after the pandemic, we had the energy crisis. Now, the energy crisis uh, was much worse in this part of the world, in Europe, rather than in the US, in Asia, or, or other places. In the US because of shale, and in Asia because of coal. As you know, they use as much coal as they can, but if we use coal in Europe, we get very heavy penalties. For all these kinds of reasons, Europe at the moment is being left behind. On the financial side, but I'm afraid also on the political side. As we can witness now from the crisis in Israel, Europe has hardly any decisive say in the world. Different leaders uh, visit Israel at different times. I don't know what every leader says from his own side. Uh, there's no united front. Some governments face uh, Palestinian troubles in their own countries, some others not. Uh, I'm afraid the, the Europe, the way it has evolved, it has become dysfunctional. The interests, for example, of the Baltic states are 180 degrees different from the interests of the Iberian Peninsula, for example. So how can you mix all this without a fiscal and political union? I'd have grave doubts. On the other hand, on the other side of the Atlantic, we have the problems in a pre-year election, which I'm afraid in the year election, which is next year, are going to become bigger. And that is going to, to be the heavy problem of next year. Can I pick you up on that? Let's talk America and politics a little bit. First, uh, first to follow up, you say you have views on America. I'm curious to hear your views. We have Joe Biden uh, announcing a big package of, of aid, bundling up Ukraine, aid for Ukraine, aid to Israel, a little bit for Taiwan as well. 
uh, but very uncertain prospects for actually getting it through because at the moment there is no government, as you say. <laughs> so how do you see all that from, uh, you know, you have a, a divided or a, a not entirely effective Europe, but a strangely uh, hamstrung America at the moment? I tell you what, in Europe, I'm, I'm very often in Brussels, uh, in Europe we have been discussing some form of IRA for at least a year, and all of a sudden, one morning, we read about the American IRA. And then there is a blame game in Europe. Why are we late? Why didn't we do it? We were the first to think about it. And then the Commission responds in an, in an irresponsive way, the responsible way, like the CRM, Critical Raw Materials Act, Nobody understands what this is and what are the benefits of the producers of the Critical Raw Materials Act. Uh, net zero uh, economy, whatever. What net zero are we talking about? To make more panels or more wind parks without a grid and without a battery technology? How far can you go? And then you have to pay in this transformation period, you have to pay fossil fuels at a high price. And that's why, as we speak, I have to tell you, 50% of energy intensive interests in Europe are shut. There is no comparison with the US. And most of the companies that close down, they move to the US or Asia. This is how it looks in Europe at the moment. Not very optimistic. I've said it many times, I'm afraid I have to say again. But uh, Joe Stiglitz, I mean, if, if you take this view and you, you refer to, to the, the, this big um, IRA and the, the effort on, on environment, there were other big legislative acts passed, the CHIPS Act and also the, in, the, Indus, uh, the, the Infrastructure Act, collectively a vast amount. And, and I, I guess you would argue that in his first term, Joe Biden has done a lot or has, has a considerable um, legislative record to run on. But what now? What now that he doesn't have a majority in, in Congress to work with and he doesn't even have a Congress to work with at the moment, where does this leave us at a very worrying time for the world? Well, it, it leaves us very worried. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the fact is uh, the U.S. is, is hamstrung. Uh, Europe is uh, in a difficult uh, uh, position at a time when clearly uh, decisive action is needed. Um, you know, if I were talking about, you know, what should Europe do, one of the things is uh, you can't rely on the United States in defense. That uh, uh, we saw, you saw with the election of Trump that he was not reliable. It could happen again, and uh, I think winning the war uh, uh, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is very important for democracy, for the rule of law, and um, Europe will, will have to enhance its defense spending, uh, and I think create a European defense force. Um, uh, Meanwhile, uh, you know, U.S. is going to have, no matter what the outcome of the election in 2024, uh, the way things are going, it uh, won't be very nice. And what I mean by that is uh, the most likely nominee will be uh, on the, uh, will be uh, nominees of the two parties will be Trump and Biden, that uh, if Biden wings, it is hard to see that Trump will accept it. He didn't accept the last time when he lost by 7 million votes. And if Trump wins, not only do we have a really governmental problem going forward, uh, but we have a domestic problem because there will almost surely have been a lot of voter suppression, a lot of prob real problems with the electoral process, 
and uh, many uh, on the Democrats will find it hard to accept. So uh, we're, we're at a moment in our history where uh, it's very hard to see any good outcome, you know, any, any stability emerging out of 2024. If I'm Vladimir Putin, I'm very much liking what you're saying at the moment, which is a, which is a concern in itself, right? I mean, it, it, I, I, think, I think that's right. And we haven't, it, it came up a little bit earlier, the information ecosystem. And uh, I think he's intervened in that information ecosystem. But even if he hadn't intervened, uh, one of the problems is that uh, social media has undermined uh, our ability to create, you might say, a, a credible uh, information ecosystem. And um, I think the consequences for our society of uh, that mixture of information, disinformation, suspicion of information and disinformation, and even truthful information, means that we are, you know, it's another dimension of the, of the uh, instability that we face in the world today. So in the few minutes we have left, I'd like to widen it out. May I, yes, uh, no, absolutely, Karen. Uh, may yeah. I add uh, to what Professor said? The American elections uh, are extremely important for the US, but is, they are equally important to Europe. Some people ask me, what do you think is the end game in the uh, Russian-Ukrainian situation? What is the end game? It's the most difficult question. And I say, I will tell you after I know the outcome of the American election. What happens in Ukraine will be decided across the Atlantic. That's number one. And number two, the biggest threat at the moment in the world is not the Russian-Ukrainian war, Russian invasion and Ukrainian resistance. The biggest problem by a long way is the situation in the Middle East. Because this may be not decided by the governments, it may be decided by the people in the street. Many governments, I include Saudi Arabia, I'm sure they would like to go ahead with the uh, Israeli uh, agreement, but can we, can MBS do it? Can he? What's going to happen if Israeli invades Gaza in the end, and there are every day on the screens all over the world what we, we all detest to see? What is the reaction in the Arab world is going to be? And what is the outcome? And what is Iran a role going to play? What is Turkey going to do? So, to make the long story short, the two biggest uh, troubles in the world at the moment, Ukraine will be decided in the American election. Israel will be decided by the people in the Arab streets. So, uh, this is sobering view from both of you. I want to ask you in these last few minutes to scrape around for some sense of where we should find some hope uh, in all this. Um, perhaps start with you. Uh, should we be entirely gloomy? Are you leaving us entirely gloomy or are there any uh, bright spots in all this? My hope, is, I, I believe in, in this great American nation, I think at the moment is divided Things have turned out to be very nasty and unpleasant for those of us who go who visit often the United States and the South and the North and everywhere. It's unpleasant. But I believe this great nation will find its way one way or another. And once America is stabilized, the whole world will be stabilized. I agree. Uh, the only qualification I would say is, I wouldn't say one way or another. I think there's only one way. 
in which... You're not at all partisan. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the Republican Party has uh, uh, collapsed into a disorganized... You know, it would be nice if it reconstituted itself, and that would be, I might say. And I, I think for a healthy democracy, you need two functioning parties. So it is absolutely essential. But uh, right now, it's hard to see that happening uh, in the Republican Party. So yeah, to give a, a, a partisan view, um, I think uh, enough Americans will see that the dysfunction that is occurring can only be addressed in one way. Um, Biden has done a lot, as you, you were mentioning that, and there are other things uh, that he's done. Um, <clears throat> one of the striking things is he's managed to, you know, he's 80, to, you know, he's 80, there's, uh, can't run everything, but good judgment of people to run things is actually the really important thing that the president does. And he's managed to appoint uh, very good people in a lot of uh, different uh, positions. And um, the young people, if, you know, if I say, you know, what is the hope? Uh, the hope is really, you, know, you might say, with the young people who are worried about climate change, who want to change in direction, um, they, they recognize the direction that we have been going is, is not a positive one. And um, the, the spirit of my students, the spirit that you see uh, and the, is uh, the source of hope. And since it's their country, you might say, they will be inheriting the fact that they, if, the, if we can get over this hump, uh, when they get control, I'm actually optimistic. Well, I, I, just perhaps to press you a little bit about that, I wanted to ask you about uh, a subject which I know you've been thinking a lot about, which is freedom. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, a book uh, with, with, uh, around that subject is, is in the works. Are you optimistic about freedom? Well, again, it's a question of if we can get over the sump. Uh, you know, the, 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 the thesis of this book that I will be coming out in April uh, is uh, that uh, one person's freedom is another person's unfreedom. Or to put it, you know, it was something that was brought out very, very vividly uh, during the pandemic. Uh, if you didn't get vaccinated, you exposed or, or wear a mask, you exposed others. So your freedom not to wear a mask or to social distance or not to get vaccinated represented a threat to the risk of life of somebody else. And so your freedom had to be balanced against the freedom to live, and you had to weigh those two. I, I happen to think freedom to live is more important. But uh, that, that was the, the, what motivated the book. And uh, try to, looking at this from an economist's point of view, uh, not the magazine, but the general economy. The profession. <laughs> and you, you think about things like um, stoplights are a regulation. It says who can go one first and then who can go next. It's coercive. You can't go. Uh, but certainly in a city like New York, if you didn't have stoplights, you had a gridlock and nobody could move anywhere. So actually stoplights, a little coercion, actually makes everybody freer. They can actually move. The city actually works. And there are lots and lots of examples of this. The Ten Commandments, you know, were restrictions. The thief couldn't steal. It restricted his ability to steal. That's a regulation. But it enhanced everybody else's ability to own property and not to worry about, uh, you know, somebody taking their property. And, and so implicitly, in, we've 
understand that we need those regulations, but actually as we become a more interdependent society, as the world's population has increased threefold in just 70 years, the world's GDP has increased 15-fold in 70 years, we've become more interactive. We've reached the limits of our planetary boundaries in ways that we didn't when we were, you know, fewer people and a lower GDP. And so the thesis of the work is, book is that now where we are, we, we have to figure out how to live with each other, and that involves managing these freedoms, balancing the freedoms in ways that, in my view, expand the freedoms that we have. Very good. Well, on that philosophical note, you mentioned the Ten Commandments. There's actually an Eleventh Commandment, which applies to conferences, which is, thou shalt stick to time as far as possible, <laughs> uh, which is a very hard one to adhere to, but we are out of time. So thank you both very much uh, for that fascinating session. Thank you.